Okay, so I'm going to walk you through a bit of my own story. Um, and I'm going to go back, not quite to the beginning, because I can't remember much of that. But I am going to tell you things about me that are personal. But I believe these things make me who I am and have helped shape me as the nurse I am. So, actually I should have said, on that first slide, that man stood next to me is my father. That's Brian Coward. Um, and that was possibly a very proud day for him when I got my floppy hat. So I was awarded my doctorate. And you'll note he had to take centre stage by getting a shirt that matched my robes. Only my father could do that. But who am I? So I'm an only child. I was born to my parents, Janet and Brian Cowden. and I was born in the town of Luton in Bedfordshire. And the reason that the title of this was from Hatter is you'll see that top middle picture is a hat factory because Luton is famous for making hats. And my mum was a milliner. At the age of 15, she undertook a seven year apprenticeship to make hats and she was amazing. But I didn't realise that when I was a kid. I found it boring. My friends were all fascinated by how artistic, how creative she was. It just didn't interest me at all. When I look back now, I realised that what I got from my mum was some working class grounded values because she did work in factories all of her life. And that side of my family were very working class. My dad was slightly more privileged in that his family were either police or publicans. What a mix. But so I came with this real mix of values. But what I came with was an understanding that people mattered. And I came with this huge understanding that all different types of people mattered. And that I shouldn't judge by what I saw or what I heard, but I needed to take an interest in people. And I guess my curiosity of people really began at quite an early age because my parents provoked me. They pushed me to go and find things out. Growing up in Luton, incredibly multicultural. And I learned a lot that really has helped me support patients and colleagues throughout my career who have different cultural needs to me. At the age of 11, my whole world fell apart. They moved us. We moved to Buckingham in Buckinghamshire, which was this white, middle class, leafy town. And I hated it. I hated the lack of diversity. I hated the privilege that was around me. And I started to see societal differences that I was quite uncomfortable with because of my own mixed and diverse background. But when I look back now, something that move did for me was put me in a really solid education system. And I have to be thankful for that now. At the time, I wasn't. I hated school, absolutely hated it. There's a picture of a deli because I've got a part-time job and I was Melly on the deli. And that's what I did. Every Saturday, I sliced ham, I cut cheese. And I remember I was the only person with tolerance for the elderly customer who would come and ask for two ounces of cheddar. And if it, ounces is in old money, by the way. If it was slightly over, they'd ask me to cut another piece. And I'd just do it because when someone asks for something, it's because that's what they want. So I think I was happy to see and fulfill the needs of others within reason. Um, and I never found anything was too much trouble as long as people were happy and smiling. At the age of 17, I developed a passion for cars and I am a complete petrol head. And any of you that know me know that my cars have just alongside my midlife crisis have got faster. They've got noisier. They're more outrageous. I love them. I love driving. And so I would say that's a part of me that matters. I'm a bit of a risk taker. You could say I'm courageous. I like to go fast, but I go fast in a measured and an informed way. At the age of 13, I announced at dinner one evening that I wanted to be a nurse. And I remember my dad spat his dinner across the table. He, my dad's ex-military. And he assumed at that time that I meant I was going to join the military to become a nurse. But I was a rule breaker. So all he could see was that this person would go in and I'd be dismissed instantly because I wouldn't do as I was told. 
So I then explained to him, I don't want to go into the military. I want to be a nurse and I want to be in the NHS and I want to look after people. And then I think my parents started to see that actually I did have some of the skills, some of the attributes, definitely a personality that would be suitable for nursing. I took myself off at the age of 13. We had a local cottage hospital and I worked, walked into there one day and I asked if I could go in and volunteer when I wasn't at school. And they took a punt. And I think that was one of the most courageous things I did. At 13, I barely wanted to speak to anyone who was an adult, they bored me. But the charge nurse there, Cliff, I'll never ever forget him, he took a punt on me. And he said, yeah, you can come in at the weekends. He said, you'll have to be supervised, but you can come in. And I went along. Every Sunday, I got up at six o'clock without fail. And I went to that hospital. I washed people, I fed people, I made beds, I had the best time ever. I loved looking after elderly patients, absolutely adored it. I had to make some decisions at that time. And there was an amazing nurse there, Veronica, a Scottish nurse who I worked with. And she really, really influenced me. I'm going back some years, because although I don't look it, I am actually quite old, and this was the 1980s. And um, I, at that point, to undertake your nurse training in a hospital setting, which it was then, you didn't need A-levels. You needed what were called O-levels. I believe they're GCSEs nowadays. But I decided it wouldn't be a bad thing to go to college. I did what was called a pre-nursing course. Um, and I did three A-levels alongside that. And one of the things that happened was a person who was a careers advisor gave me the worst advice ever. Because they said to me, you shouldn't be doing nursing, you're doing A-levels, you should be doing medicine. And I just remember at 16, 17 saying, but I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I know what nursing is. And they near enough argued with me. And I remember going home and saying to my mum, I, I want to be a nurse. And they're telling me I have to go and do medicine. And my mum very wisely said, you can do whatever you want, Elaine. And mum and we'll both be here with you, me and your dad. And I said, well, I could be a really great nurse. It doesn't make any difference whether I've got A-levels or not. It's who I am. So I went to college, I did that pre-nursing course, I ignored what I now know was terrible, terrible advice, and I followed the path I was on. So I had to make these decisions, where did I go? So I said to you, I'm an only child. I was a bit mollycoddled, I guess. I've never been spoilt rotten, but I've definitely been loved, never wanted for anything. So did I leave home? Well, yeah, obviously, 18 pubs, boys, fast cars. So yeah, I left home. I didn't want to stay in the local vicinity. I wanted to move on, find my own legs and do what I wanted to do. At the time, there was a clearing system for nursing, which is a bit like UCAS now and how you enter university. You had to pick the hospital that you wanted to do your training at. And if I remember rightly, there were six. And so I picked six and I ended up with six places. I don't know how, but I did. And my dad and I sat and we wrote a pros and a cons list of what did I like when I went there. This is a picture of King's College Hospital in South East London. When I went there, I was welcomed. I met nurses who were interested in me and I met nurses that I wanted to be around. That was the most important thing. And now as a head of school, when we have open days, when I meet students, I hope that's how I make them feel because that welcome was so important to me. So I was at King's for um, three years, three months then, and four days, I think it is, for nurse training going back into the 80s. And I passed and there's my buckle. So proudly, my big badge of honour in the days where we wore those uniforms. And that's now mounted in my study at home in a um, case not wearing it. You're now wondering what on earth that picture is. It's bone marrow. So very early on, I was attracted to work with cancer patients. I had an affinity for those patients and their families. And that's what mattered for me. It was the package of care. So it wasn't just about one person. It was the broader. And 
meaning family, not just in the sense of blood relatives, but who matters to this individual. At King's, there were no solid cancers. It was haematology. So that's where I went and worked. And after two years, and you'll be shocked, this is how it was then because of the way we trained, I became a junior sister. And I opened the bone marrow transplant unit at King's, which I'm still incredibly proud to say is still there. And I recently went there and saw the signage to that old unit. But I then decided I needed to move on in my career. I had to go back to the beginning because at that time, degrees in nursing were getting more and more. Diplomas, Project 2000 was coming about. I had a certificate from a hospital. That was my registration. That was my education. So I went back to the beginning. This is the Royal Marsden Hospital. I applied and I was given a place to undertake a BSc honours in cancer nursing. I had to go right back to being a junior staff nurse to the point where they actually even put us in these see-through white uniforms with white shoes. I was like the lowest of the low. So I went from junior sister, but I knew that retrograde step was going to give me a degree, as long as I worked. I ended up specialising in breast cancer, and particularly I ended up specialising in premenopausal, so younger, and also male breast cancers. So my client group was a bit niche, but I liked that. And again, it was that family-centred, the unusual, being curious about things that weren't the norm of society. So policy at that time was changing. I won't bore you with it, but cancer centres and cancer units were coming about and where patients were treated was being dealt with. And these positions were coming up for lead cancer nurses. Education was high on the agenda. And I thought, well, I might as well just go and be a manager. So I had an interview at this place on the coast, and you might recognise the pier. And this is going back a long, long time before some of you were born. I went for this interview. It was the most gruelling interview I've ever had. And I got called back the second day to go and have lunch with the director of nursing. A little bit scary. The reason that she did that was to see if she'd get on with me. And my best mate who I trained with, Joe, gave me the best advice ever. And she said, when you go and meet her for lunch, be yourself. If you like one another, it'll work. If you don't get on, it won't. Fantastic. We got on, I got the job. I walked in to a cancer centre, and again, I'm going to give you the caveat. This is a long time ago. It is not the case now. Morale was just in some red zone. There was no money. And the staff there were lovely but they didn't have the right education background. There was no research going on apart from clinical trials. There was just nothing dynamic happening which would support patient care and safety. So I spent at least two weeks wondering what on earth I'd done and what I'd walked into. I then remembered that during my time at King's, I'd come across this amazing psychologist who had helped by giving me clinical supervision and supporting me. I went back to the chief nurse and I said, the team need this. The only way we're going to move forward is if we talk about where we are and what our aspirations are. So I was a real advocate for mentoring and reflecting early on in my career. But I was also on this massive, steep learning curve because I had a team looking up to me to do everything. I had things, targets that I needed to meet and a budget that wasn't big enough. And I felt I needed some other skills. So I went off to do an MBA. And that really put me in good stead for helping me organise my brain, organise my thinking and move my practice forward in a dynamic but also an agile way. But I also had this bugbear that there was no cancer-specific education. And I was knocking on the door of the local university and saying, I'm sending staff to London, why? and they invited me to go and run a cancer course. So I stepped into the world of education and I became a lecturer practitioner. And I spent 50% of my week in the university and 50% in the cancer centre. And it was difficult. It was very difficult trying to lineate between those two roles of being a leader, being a novice in education. 
I was late for everything. And I've never been late for anything in my life. Time was just the biggest deal in my life. I didn't have enough time. I was studying, I was working, I was teaching, I was organizing. And actually, I became unwell because I overdid it and I didn't know how to compartmentalize. And I went back to practice full time. And I've just put these two things on here and these are extracts from my reflective diary. So the answer phone in my office and I just remember the monotone voice of, you missed the finance meeting again. Please, can you ensure you attend the next one? And I remember standing there going, well, I haven't got any money anyway. There's no point in me coming, you're just gonna tell me off. And then the patient complaint meeting was at 10.30 this morning. You weren't there, there was nobody present for oncology. I haven't got any patient complaints. What do you want me there for? I've got plaudits. And certainly the next meeting I went to, I demonstrated courage. I took a box of thank you cards and I emptied them on the table in a non-aggressive way. And I said, this is what we get in oncology and I will share why. So I contributed in a really different way and I'm sure being in education made me think differently. But then I started to get frustrated and I thought I've gone the wrong way. So for the second time in my career, I went back to the beginning again. That's where I first met Anita actually, where I went and I got a job at the University of Surrey as an unqualified tutor in cancer nursing lowest of the low. I had my clinical experience, I had my knowledge. I had leadership experience, but I felt I didn't at that time. So back into being a novice, and at times it was frustrating, but I also was hungry, I was hungry to learn. So between the years 2001, which is when I went to the University of Surrey in 2007, I was doing all right. I liked what I was doing. I'd got really good networks in clinical areas of cancer care, but something was missing. I needed to lead again. And I'd realised that I couldn't just be one of the fish. I needed to be the fish at the front, not because I'm a control freak, although it has been said, but actually I love being with teams of energetic people. And somebody has to lead the team, not because I come up with all the ideas by any means. Surrey invested in me and, and I think this was a real turning point in my career where I realised that I had something that was worth investing in. So I undertook a master's programme in education. For me, the thing that matters and what I want you all to hear is the word mastery. And I know that for some of you, thinking about studying at university is really difficult. Well, I hated school, so don't forget that. Okay, I've always found it hard. When I did a master's in education, my level of curiosity went off the scale. And what I realized was that all of my knowledge and all of my experience made me look for things. So it's not about being clever. It's about being hungry to learn. It's about wanting to succeed and take your career somewhere and what that gives you back. So don't think I'm not clever enough because it's just not true. I became the head of programmes for continuing professional development. So I led our CPD and I led our postgraduate programmes. And I can remember at the time, you know, thinking of things like, Malayne, could you supervise a master's dissertation? And I'd be like, are they, are they talking to someone else? Because I've only just got a master's. But realising that I needed that confidence and my self-belief because I was quite good at what I did and I enjoyed it. Student feedback made me know that. So having that self-confidence, not being cocky, but being confident and knowing what your good points are and what you can do is really important. The school went through a big restructure back in 2015 and I was put into a strategic leadership role. I wasn't put into it. I applied for it and was interviewed for it. And I became the director of education for the school. And that was a real opportunity for me because I got to teach, I got to research because I was doing my doctorate by then, but I also got to strategize. So my thoughts, my ideas, my wants came into what I was doing. 
making decisions with the team. It was great. But in that role, I needed to study. So I undertook a doctor of education, so a doctorate, which gave me my floppy hat in the end. I then had an opportunity that came up where the, the head of school at the time had to leave for family circumstances. And she came running into me and she said, Melaine, somebody needs to cover as head of school. And I sat and went, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And she said, you've got 20 minutes to make a decision. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, it won't be me though, will it? Because I haven't got a doctorate. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a professor. I'm Malay. And I realised, and I remember I rang my dad and I rang my best mate. And they both went, why are you even asking that question? Of course you have to be the interim head of school. And I did it. And you know, I loved it because I got a voice at the top of the university. And I got to make changes that were good. I got to undo some changes that shouldn't have happened. And I feel proud that I was able to put the school back in a good place. I then applied to become the substantive head of school. That was in 2016. And I'm still in that role and I love it. When I finished my doctorate, my research, which was all around reflection, please don't groan, reflective practice, informed the NMC revalidation process. Now, love it or hate it, we have to answer to the public. And reflecting on our practice is a really important thing to do. So coming up with some form of method that documents that nurses and nursing associates do reflect was really important. And I was so proud to be asked to use my doctoral research to inform that process. And then to work with the NMC as a consultant to launch that across the UK. On the back of that work, moving policy on and informing practice, that led to working with Australia and the Australian Research Council. And my boss at the time said to me, you really should be putting in for your prof professoriate a personal chair. And that they, I had imposter syndrome again. I haven't been a doctor that long. But actually, my reach of research, the impact, the influence, and for me, the patient at the centre of everything I do. So I went for it and I became Professor Melaine Coward. And then a new dean came into our faculty and shared with me that there were certain aspects of management that really weren't his thing. He's a stellar scientist. So he put a deputy position in post in the, in the structure and I applied for it and got it. So I've got two leadership roles I've got my research, but I still teach, and that's what I love. That is who I am, and I am a nurse through and through. My biggest achievement to date, and I have to get this in, was our relocation at the University of Surrey to the Cape Granger building. I had to fight to get the building called this, but it mattered to me. Hello, my name is. The legacy that Kate has left us in the way that we communicate with patients and families is just so important. And I have to say her husband, Chris Poynton, works really closely with us. He's become a friend and he visits the school frequently. And I'm just so proud that that name is on that building. The building's amazing. Come and see it. But at the bottom of everything I've done, at the bottom of everything I've achieved and I've thrown myself into, I've been guided, I've been mentored, I've been coached, I've gone and sought those opportunities out. And I've always been part of a team and I've been lucky to be part of amazing teams. And I just wanna share with you this quote. And this is when JF Kennedy visited NASA and it's back in 1962, but he saw a guy, he was a janitor, he was walking along with a broom in his hand and he said, hi, I'm Jack Kennedy. What are you doing? And he said, hello, Mr. President. I'm helping to put man on the moon. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what grade you are. We are all part of the impact of our teams. So my message, believe in yourself. Know that you can do what you want to do. Just got to find the way to get there and who is going to guide you and help you do it in the correct way for you. Thank you.